In this video, I'll walk you through how I created this logo animation. Along the way, I'll share some modeling tips, physics, and animation tricks, a few handy add-ons I used, how I added sound effects to get the timing just right, and then we'll render it and polish it up in DaVinci Resolve. A quick heads up, this isn't a full step-by-step -step tutorial. It's more of a quick overview with some useful tips sprinkled in. I think in this case, that's the best way to highlight what really matters. All right, let's dive in and make some logo animation. I didn't start with a specific ID for this animation, I just wanted to experiment. So I began by recreating the logo in 3D, just to see where it might take me. First I modeled the keyhole and used it as a boolean cutter on the box. Even though it wasn't necessary, I kept the cutter all quads. I've been doing a lot of subdivision modeling lately, and this was just a good opportunity to practice clean topology. To shape the lid of the box, I added a loop cut, beveled it, and removed the geometry in between. Then I filled the holes on both objects. I enabled random colors in the viewport overlays to help distinguish objects more clearly. It's a simple trick, but really useful when modeling. After using the keyhole as a boolean cutter, I applied the boolean modifier and turned on cavity and shadows in the viewport overlays for even more visual clarity in the viewport. Still, without a clear animation ID, I decided to refine the geometry, and I cleaned up the n-gons, turned everything into quads, and prepared it for subdivision. Here I used an outset, that's just an inset, press I, followed by O for outset, to add a protective loop around the keyhole. I creased all the edges that I wanted to stay sharp, and then tested them with the subdivision modifier. In order to be able to triple edge everything, I converted those creased edges to have a bevel weight of one, and I removed the decreasing, and then I added a bevel modifier. I set that to two segments, that gives you three edges, and then I used the limit method weight, so that it only affects those edges marked with a bevel weight of one. So that gives me those three holding edges with a bevel amount of 0.002 or two millimeters. Eventually, though, I decided to soften the look and I bumped that up to 0.02, which is 2 centimeters. I duplicated the object and put it in a backup collection. That's always a smart move before you apply modifiers. Then I applied the bevel modifier to finalize the geometry. Next, I added a camera. I recommend doing that early on. It really helps you plan the shots and the timing better as you build up the animation. I then explored the simple deform modifier to get some quick ideas. Thanks to the clean quad topology, I was able to get some interesting deformations, as you can see. But I wasn't super inspired by this, so I thought, let's try rigid body simulations instead. And I rebuilt the top part of the box quickly to be one single object, just to uh, simplify things. Still lacking a final concept, I decided to switch focus to the text for a while. So you can use any font installed on your computer in Blender. But I wanted to have something fresh, something playful, and I found a nice one on Google Fonts, where I downloaded it and then I installed it in my system. So then after refreshing the font list, I was able to use that in Blender. I tweaked the uh, thickness and bevel settings of the text, and then I just converted it to a mesh. I could have just used this terrible geometry, by the way, it wouldn't have made a difference, but I tried using Quad Remesher, which is a commercial add-on, and I wanted to see how well it handled the remeshing of the text. And it actually did a great job. There's just one issue, the front and back faces weren't connected to the middle. So I just deleted everything but the front and then extruded it again manually. To sharpen the edges, I selected them and creased them. And then after a bit of tweaking, I added a bevel modifier and switched the creased edges to edges with bevel weights for a cleaner control of the bevel modifier. Here's a useful trick, if you run into overhang issues, like this, with subdivision modeling, set the outer miter in the bevel modifier to arc, and then connect the converging vertices with an edge, by selecting them and pressing J, to form two triangles. And then when you have two segments, Blender automatically turns those triangles into quads, and your overhang is gone. So that's a really cool trick. To be clear, I did not need this level of topology for the text, I just kind of enjoyed the process. It was a nice warm-up for my brain, and I might need to deform the text later anyway. Plus the smooth bevel gives it a nice visual polish and makes it match the box also a little bit better. I then separated each text object into individual letters and added a ground plane. For rigid body simulations, origin placement is really crucial. I set the 3D cursor to the bottom of each object and then set the origin to the 3D cursor. 
This ensures that they land upright and don't immediately fall over. After converting the texts to active rigid bodies, I ran a quick simulation and it looked fine, so I baked the results to keyframes. Same for the 3D characters, although the 3 took a bit more effort to balance properly. Next, I parented these text objects to empties so that I could uh, control their skill and where to place them. Then I animated their skill from 0 to 1 over a few frames so they just pop into existence and fall down naturally. And something interesting I discovered is if you type scale in the timelines search bar, you can isolate all the scale keyframes. So that's very convenient if you just want to fine tune the placement of those scale keyframes. So next I tried animating the cube to be sort of tossed into the scene, but I could never really get it quite right. And then when trying to adjust the camera placement, Blender gave me a cryptic message. No suitable context info for active keying set. And I couldn't really find any way to solve this, and I just didn't feel like wasting a lot of time on it, so I just opened a new blend file and appended everything from the previous file into it. And of course that fixed it. Sometimes the simplest workaround is the best one. Still not satisfied with the cube animation, I just deleted its animation and tried something completely new. I created a stunt cube to handle the physics part, and that I can later parent the actual logo cube to. This way the logo stays oriented properly, no matter how the stunt cube ends up. Next I made a hole in the floor with a cutter cube, and then I applied the boolean modifier there. And then I animated the stunt cube to fly up by setting two z-axis keyframes, and toggling the animated property from on to off in a single frame. That gives it some upward velocity before then the rigid body simulation takes over. And to make the animation a bit more dynamic, I modeled hatch doors that open just in time for the cube to launch through and then quickly close again. That was pretty easy to animate, just a few keyframes. And then of course the doors were set as passive rigid bodies and marked as animated. I wanted the cube to bounce more convincingly, so I experimented with the bounciness value and added a slight initial rotation. And these two tweaks made a big difference. Once I was happy with the result, I baked the stunt cube's motion to keyframes. And then I parented the hero cube to it and disabled the visibility of the stunt cube. Physics simulations can be unpredictable in Blender, so be prepared for lots of trial and error. I actually tried to scale the keyframe influence proportionally, but I couldn't yet find a way to do it. So if you know how, please let me know in the comments, but I just moved on. I also decided to redo the 3D text animation because I wasn't super happy with it, and origin placement and bounce values made all the difference. Eventually I was happy with how it looked, and I baked it to keyframes. At this point everything started to come together, but the timing still felt off. There were just too many things happening all at once. And that's an important thing to think about. Your viewer can only focus on one thing at a time. So pacing and animation is really critical. And to fix this I added sound effects directly in Blender. And for that I used Soundly. That's a sound browser that pulls from both free and paid libraries. I have the paid version, but I think the free one lets you index your own sounds, or at least those from freesound.org. You can preview a clip, select just the part that you want, and then drag it right into Blender Sequencer. Really cool, really fast, really easy to use. From there it's easy to sync the audio to the visuals and adjust the volume. Unfortunately I didn't record the system audio for this tutorial, but here is what the final animation sounds like, with all the sound effects in place. So that's the result so far. This product started with no clear ID at all, just some modeling practice, but it evolved into something much more interesting. So you probably want to know, how did I go from this to this? Well, first of all, I used cycles for rendering to get a softer, a little bit more subtle look. And I enabled GPU rendering and used the Turbo Tools add-on to speed things up significantly. For the materials, I used the Sanctus Material Library, which is a paid pack, and it comes with an asset browser collection, so you can simply drag and drop the materials on your objects. I quickly UV unwrapped the objects by selecting everything in edit mode, hitting U and choosing Smart UV Project. It actually took me a while to decide on the materials, not because they weren't good, but because there were so many beautiful ones to choose from. I kept experimenting with different looks, which was both fun and time consuming. Next I set up some lighting. I only used area lights, which I controlled using the Gaffer add-ons UI. I tweaked the camera movement a bit after switching to a longer focal length. That helped to bring all the elements visually closer together for a more cohesive composition. For the cube that shoots up through the hole, I thought it would be fun to have a light shining up from underneath, 
So I used an area light pointing up and a cube with a low density volume material. At this point, I just got rid of the HDRI lighting. I wanted more precise control, and I think that area lights let you really sculpt the look of the light that you want. To get that soft, colorful gradient look in the background, I placed another cube with a print spot volume material behind all the objects. And then I added colored area lights to shine into it, and this creates those dreamy gradients behind the text and makes the ground plane disappear into the fog, which adds a nice touch. Just be careful with the volume density. Less is more. One small but important detail, I rotated the individual text elements slightly in edit mode, just to give them a bit more depth and make them face the camera better. Honestly, the hardest part of this whole project for me was choosing the right colors and materials for the text objects. Eventually, I found a combination that I was happy with. I also added an empty to use as the camera target for shallow depth of field. It's very easy to go overboard with that effect, but this time I managed to hold back. I did a quick low rest test render just to make sure everything looked good. Always a good idea before you commit to hours and hours of rendering. After a few more tweaks, I rendered the final image sequence and moved on to grading in DaVinci Resolve. Nothing too fancy, I just played with some sliders until it looked better. I also used some of the built in effects like a vignette and film emulation. And you can see that that last bit of color grading really makes a big difference. And that's how I made this logo animation. I hope you found it interesting and thank you so much for watching all the way to the end.